With factories and workshops getting bigger, workers found themselves in need of something to help them lift and move heavy loads around. At the same time, they were also in need of shunting engines capable of moving and organizing many of the trucks that carried supplies and minerals around the site too. Most steam cranes were either too big or too slow to fit inside factory buildings and move trucks around effectively, and most shunting engines lacked any means of helping lift heavy loads off the ground. In an ideal world, they needed an engine that was a combination of both a crane and a shunting locomotive. Locomotive. So they built just that. Introducing Crane Tank Engines The first record I can find of one being built was in 1872 for the North London Railway. Formerly an 040 shunting engine, it was rebuilt into an 042 with a small steam crane set above the back axle. It's not specified what it was built for, but it was likely used around the engine works carrying parts and helping assemble other locomotives. The Great Western followed suit not too long after, modifying a broad gauge tank engine into a standard gauge 240 in 1882. 81, with a crane mounted in place of the coal bunker. Once completed, it operated around the locomotive works at Swindon. They later built another two crane engines in 1901, both being modified pannier tanks named Cyclops and Steropes respectively, with a third engine, Hercules, being built later in 1922. The cranes were capable of lifting six tons and had an 18-foot radius, making them more than suited to any work that needed doing. They mostly worked at Swindon, however Cyclops spent a considerable amount of its working life at the Stafford Road Locomotive Works in Wolverhampton. One of them also spent a weekend in Paddington in 1931, helping move preset concrete sections into place while work was being done extending a platform. These engines were eventually withdrawn and scrapped in 1936. By this point, many companies had designed and built their own crane tanks for various uses. The Great Northern Railway modified a G2 engine in a similar manner to the Great Western Railway, albeit with a much smaller crane. Nielsen and co built tank engines which were much smaller and involved the crane being mounted around the engine's funnel. Rather than being built for use in locomotive works, these were designed for factory work and other basic industrial jobs. Robert Stevenson and Hawthorne put together a few engines out of spare parts they had after an overseas order was cancelled. The cranes of these engines had a 20-foot radius, but weren't fitted with winches. Instead, hooks were set in place on the arm at different lengths to carry different amounts of weight. The crane arm also had a gap to allow it to slip over the engine's chimney when not in use. Possibly the most well-known design is the crane tanks built by Dubs & Co of Glasgow, with its crane mounted in the middle of its boiler with a slightly curved design to allow the arm to safely pass over the engine's cabin funnel. There are many other designs built by many other companies, but the main difference usually boil down to the size of the crane and the power of the locomotives. Their versatility led to them being used all over the UK and other parts of the world, not only in locomotive works, but doing other jobs as well. Many ended up working in factories, moving and loading supplies. Others worked around goods yards that required transferring smaller loads like metal pipes and machine parts from one wagon to another. And quite a few worked around docks and shipyards, not only helping unload ships, but also moving parts needed to build and repair them. Depending on the work, some were further modified, with some engines working at steel mills being fitted with electromagnets powered by steam generators fitted to the engine. Despite them essentially being a direct upgrade compared to most other shunting engines, they weren't entirely perfect. Naturally, the addition of a crane arm came with all the dangers of operating a crane. However, drivers also had to take care while moving the engine while the crane was carrying a load, as braking or accelerating too sharply could cause the load to swing about, not something that's particularly desired in a crowded workshop. On top of this, the arm of most crane engines reached past their buffers, meaning they'd likely accidentally hit any coaches or taller goods wagons if the driver wasn't careful, significantly limiting the kinds of trucks and wagons it was safe for them to shunt and work with. The additional weight and height of the cranes also limited where they could go. While most factories and shunting yards were capable of supporting them, many still preferred an engine with a smaller profile as they were much easier to accommodate. And finally was their lack of fuel storage. The cranes many of these engines sat where their bunkers would be, and the ones with bunkers still couldn't hold much in reserve. This was never a problem for the most part, as working in dockyards and factories usually meant they were never too far away from a place they could refuel. However, it did significantly limit their range outside of shunting, meaning they were useless if they needed to travel any further than the yards they worked in. While none of these things were ever a massive issue while they worked, they were limiting factors in regards to the work they could do outside of just shunting and lifting 
lifting things. Many locomotive works did away with crane tanks after the 1930s. However, many still continued to work in yards and factories well into the 1960s, with some in the UK working as late as the 1970s. In the end, they were gradually phased out by smaller road cranes and the overall decline of railway usage across the country. Quite a few different crane engines have been preserved and are both running on and displayed at various railways and museums. All in all, crane tank engines are certainly a quirky, niche design that turned out to be just the right tool for the job. While they didn't exactly cause a boom in the world of railway engineering, they certainly lifted the potential steam engines had to adapt to different roles. Sure, not everyone quite likes their jib, but for many, their unique appearance and practicality is enough to leave them hooked. Subscribe for more.